Okay, we're going to be talking about uh, humanizing online environments today, but I'm, I'm going to start out with something a little bit different first. But I want you to keep the concept of humanizing online in mind as we kind of talk through this. Uh, so how many, how many uh, basketball players do I have in here? How many play basketball? No? No? Okay, there's a few. There's a few. Okay, so... I'm going to show you a tap. In a, in a previous life, I used to uh, be a high school teacher and a girls' basketball coach. And uh, so this is like one of the drills that we used to do in practice when we're practicing ball handling. So I'm going to demonstrate this skill, and then I'm going to invite a couple of you to come up and try it yourselves. You ready for this? You ready? I'm looking right at you, Mitch. <laughs> okay, so this is, called the, this is called the figure eight. I'm going to have to set the mic down. So, so now I need two volunteers to come up and try it for me. Who, who wants to come up and try it? I need some, two. I need two people to try it. All right, let's do it. One more. Yeah, come up, Alexi. Okay. All right, I need you to try that real fast. Oh, no. <laughs> There it is, yeah, yeah, <laughs> nicely done. <laughs> All right, that, that just feels really wrong. That just, let's, let's see it, let's see it. <laughs> yeah, there it is. There it is. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there's all sorts of things we can process here. How does this relate to uh, us teaching online? How does this relate to us teaching online? Yeah. We might look at something and understand it one way, but when we're trying to do it online, we, we can't. It's too big a football. We can't seem to get it through. Good, I like that. So a lot of times in online classes, sometimes when we're, we're trying to share something with them or teach them something, it comes across one way, and maybe we don't have the ability, given the, the technology or whatever it is, for them to be able to demonstrate the same thing for us, or, or uh, there's, there's certainly challenges that way, right? Good, what else? Mitch? Given that online kind of techniques are new, or newer at least, uh, it's highly likely that the way that the instructor learns the content that they're teaching is not an online setting, right? Mm -hmm. And so that the way that they have become used to, oh, look how easy it is, and look, I can do it, you can do it too. Well, learning in an online environment may not be something the instructor ever experienced. And obviously that's going to that's gonna bias them in their ability to, to teach effectively. Good, I like that. So kind of the idea that um, because online instruction is kind of a newer thing, a lot of us who are teaching online may not have actually received that same content in an online format. And so teaching it and conveying it that way can be, can be very different. Good, I like that. Other thoughts? One more. Yeah. See, there's a difference in, in tools. The, the goal is the same, which is to choose a figure eight, but then you as a professor have a perfect tool because you, you, know, you have all the knowledge and the ability Good. <laughs> Good, I like that. So a lot of times we, 
We may be able to show them resources or show them tools, but they may not have access to those same tools or those same resources. So I, I actually found that to be very true this, this summer when I went and taught in Ecuador. The, the course I was teaching was virtual learning environments, and all of the students in, those, in that class were K-12 in-service teachers. So they, they were teaching their own classes. And the goal of the class was for me to show them how to use technology to teach. So all of them were teaching English in their schools in Ecuador. Show them how to teach using technology in their schools. Vast differences in access to technology between the schools and the different students that were in that class. Some of them came from courses or schools that were up in the highlands that had very little funding. In fact, one school didn't even have electricity in their building, right? Compared to some of the schools, some of the private schools that were in the big cities that have plenty of resources to be able to do things like that. So absolutely. Uh, we see that with teaching quite a bit. Okay. So when we, when we think about online teaching and teaching in general, um, I'd like to refer back to something that Dan Chambliss talked to us about once. He came here for an ETE seminar, and, he, and really what he focused on was telling us how in, in college, in the higher education experience, really what matters for student success is that a student can connect to a faculty, one or even two. If they can make that connection, that is one of those key indicators that they're going to be successful and that they're going to be able to have a, a successful learning experience at the university and then go on to have a career afterwards. He spent 10 years researching this at his institution and this was one of the major findings that a student making a connection with a faculty was a, a major indicator for their success. So I want you to keep that in mind as we're talking about uh, online environments. So when you think about humanizing an online course, what are some of the things that come to mind? When we say humanizing an online course, what are some of the things that come to mind? Interaction, Interaction not feel isolated. Good, what else? Good feedback. Say that again? Feedback. feedback, providing feedback. What else? Giving students choices. Ooh, giving students choices. I like that. Yeah. Ooh, personality, showing your personality, yes. Yeah, don't be a robot, right? <laughs> Good, other things, humanizing your online course. These are all great. Collaboration. Collaboration, yeah. One more. Acknowledging the limitations. Ooh, acknowledging limitations. I like that too. Perfect. So we're going to address all of these as we kind of talk about this through the concept of uh, architecture of engagement. So Riggs and Linder talk about this in their paper. And, and one of the things they bring up is in a physical classroom like this, when a student walks in, they immediately see the environment and the environment signals to them the types of interactions that are gonna happen. So in a setting like this where we have kind of like stadium seating, right, and there's a presentation area at the front, what types of interactions are going to take place in this, in this space, in this environment? It's a lecture hall. You're going to sit there, I'm going to talk to you, right? We don't have that luxury in an online course, right? Students are going to come into that online environment and the environment doesn't inherently signal to them what's going to happen, what type of interactions are going to happen. Right? Have you seen this when you teach classes? I know from when I took online classes as a graduate student, I certainly felt this way. You log into the course and you, you try to orient yourself, right? Okay, what, where am I going to be going? How am I going to access these, these materials? Things like that. So thinking about this concept of architecture of engagement, the, the environment speaking or signaling to us um, how we're going to interact. And Riggs and Linder further explain these three main ideas on how you can create this architecture of engagement in your online class. So first of all, it's this syllabus. Um, that's really where we want to point students first. And, and most of our course designs is 
we're really trying to push the student to the syllabus first. That's our first opportunity as instructor to set clear expectations for the students. Let them know, one, uh, I always like to put at the top my communication expectations, right? So if you contact me, I will get back to you within 24 to 48 hours. So that's clear. If I'm reaching out to you, I'm going to do it via the announcements, I'm going to do it via message, and I'm going to set those clear expectations. However, we do know uh, through the data that we've collected on this that the syllabus isn't always the first place that the students go, right? <laughs> um, Ever? <laughs> Ever? Sometimes. We do get some students that their first click is the syllabus, but true. Well, I mean, Go. Oh, do they ever actually even make it to the syllabus? They, they never make it to the syllabus, yeah. <laughs> We actually looked at that too to see how many clicks in the course before students were accessing the syllabus. And sometimes it was like 14 clicks over two weeks before they made it to the syllabus. <laughs> right? It, it can happen. Yes, that's absolutely true. Sometimes the students don't go there. Especially in the millennials. And, and actually, Piotr, that's a great segue to the second point, is a course orientation. right? So in a course orientation, we give an introduction to the instructor. We give an introduction to the course content itself. But sometimes we can also provide kind of a walkthrough, a step through of when you're in this environment, when you're in this class, this is, this is the direction you should be going you should first log in and look at the current module. And I'm gonna have a, a weekly summary for each module of what you're gonna be doing, where you should be going. Right, so that, that course orientation is helpful. And along with that is, is also designing uh, a module course structure that is easy to navigate, easy to understand for the students. It's straightforward, it's simple to, to navigate. Go ahead, Aaron. All right, so when you're building out your course, this is the chance for you to create um, this environment that is more human. Um, and I'm gonna show you a couple things that Travis mentioned, but I also want to add something onto um, what we need to be putting on our syllabus. So as Travis talked about contact information, um, all of this information that goes on the syllabus, all the normal stuff, but you want to make sure that they are aware of when you will be contacting them, how best to contact you. Um, and then the other thing I want to add with the syllabus is rationale. Because if you're not telling your students why you're doing something, they may just kind of think that it's busy work and shut off really early on. So if you're letting your students know the rationale behind what you're doing, then you may find that they're more apt to participate. Um, just a quick example, um, I designed this course for the ITLS program. It's a, it's a tools class, um, so if any of you are familiar with the ITLS department, they call these tools classes, and what it is is I'm showing students how to use an authoring tool called Adobe Captivate. But I also had discussions because I had undergrad and grad students in there. I had undergrad students who hadn't gone through any instructional design training, and I wanted to give them a brief overview of that. But then I also wanted to go through things like accessibility um, and why we would be using Adobe Captivate as an authoring tool. And I did get um, a comment, uh, a negative comment, that said, this is a tools class. Why are we using discussions? Why are we even, you know, why, are, why do we need to know all this extra stuff? Why can't you just teach me how to use the tool? So I then went back, and that's, that's the point where I went back and I added rationale. And I told the students in the syllabus, we're doing this because someday you're going to be out in the work field wanting to build something in Adobe Captivate. But with this course, I'm also showing you how to go through the steps in order to build content to put into Adobe Captivate to then show to an audience. You so, right, you have to be able to collaborate with others. So putting that rationale in your syllabus is also really important and this is a great opportunity when they first come into your course to be able to show that. So I showed you the syllabus, now let's show you this course introduction. 
I am fine putting, you know, pictures of myself and talking about myself. It's fine. Um, <laughs> I'm okay, really. Um, but anyway, and I love showing off my adorable boys. So showing the students who I am and um, the kind of instructor I want to be, and hopefully I'm showing them that I am approachable and someone that they can talk to, I really strive to do that. So making this um, a nice place for them to be and hopefully a, a homey place for them to be is really important to me. But then I also have a few steps for them to go through. Reading the syllabus, purchasing their textbooks, looking at the library information. It's so important that students know what's available to them. I've come across so many students who have no idea that they can go online and search on the library database and find books and be able to read them for free. Um, but also showing them a Canvas student orientation if they're new, and then reading about academic integrity and etiquette is really important. I want them to be nice to each other <laughs> while they're online. Question. Yeah, oh, sorry. Is that book available online? No, it's not actually. Um, I, you act, this, this is brand new because Adobe Captivate 2019 came out last year. So this is a, like a $35 book on Amazon. It's actually a really good book. I taught it in the course. It's got some really good, <laughs> it's got some really uh, good stuff in it. Anyway, um, so then what was our, oh, modular course structure, right. So let me go to the modules. So I like to build out a course week by week, especially an online course, so that the students know exactly what they're doing week by week. So, and then as Travis talked about, this easy, easy to navigate course will make it better and more accessible for your students. So each week they know that there's an overview. I'm putting the overview and their assignments in all of these weeks. So I'll show you one of the overviews that I have. I also made a video each week, just an introduction. I think the shortest one was two and a half minutes and the longest one was probably 11 to 12 minutes because I had to address some things that had happened the week before. I was the guest speaker. Oh, that's right. There's one that's like 20 minutes, but that's because Travis <laughs> was on there. Um, <laughs> Anyway, and I did have guest speakers, and I loved that. I, anytime I can, I love to have guest speakers because I want to let students know that wherever they are, really the person sitting next to them might be an expert in something. And so I always try and, and reiterate that. But I did do an introduction each week, once again, to hopefully show them that I'm approachable and maybe a fun person to talk to, um, or I like to think I am. Um, but then I also had objectives, um, readings, and then tutorials that went along. These are YouTube videos. As we got into the class, I did screen capture tutorials and things like that. But it's, it's kind of thinking outside the box and trying to figure out how to reach your students in unique ways. And as we know, they're not going to really pay attention to videos for very long, so that's why my introductions were really short. And I did see just a couple days ago, I actually looked at the views, and more of my students viewed my videos at the beginning of the semester than at the end, because they kind of knew that it was just me saying hi. So, um, but I still enjoy them. I mean, it was still worth it for me to make them, whether they're, they're watching them or not. But, and like I said, I like to keep things simple, so I, because I've linked all of the files in my pages, I get rid of files in my navigation, I get rid of pages in my navigation because they're, all, they're going to be able to find everything on those overview pages and in the modules. So I like to direct them that way. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on the theory behind this um, of what we're talking about, but this is kind of a helpful model to keep in mind. It's called the Community of Inquiry Framework. And specifically, when we're talking about humanizing the online course, we're talking about the social presence aspect. So we're talking about social presence. Uh, and in a helpful way to think about that comes from uh, Michelle Pekansky Brock, who I actually am going to give a plug here for, because she's going to be coming to our campus and doing an ETE seminar uh, on October 3rd. And she talks a lot about this in her work. So her first, I told you I had a slide about a robot, right? <laughs> So her, uh, her first tip here on how to humanize the online learning environment is presence, or in other words, don't be a robot. So create lively, welcome videos like what Erin was just talking about. 
You can also provide feedback to your students using video or audio on their assignments, and this is really easy to do in Canvas. You can also offer uh, times to meet the students in a synchronous way, so whether that's on like WebEx or Skype or FaceTime or whatever it is. I also like the idea of making it an option on discussion boards for students to respond in writing, with audio, or with video. Mm -hmm. Our next tip is awareness, so knowing who your students are. A helpful way to do this is to provide a survey to your students in week one uh, to kind of get to know them. You can also do like an, an icebreaker type discussion uh, to help to get to know your students and also to help to get help them to get to know each other. Uh, and that can also be a good way to build in formative feedback loops, right? So you can model the way that you're going to be accepting and providing video feedback in a low stakes icebreaker at the start of the course and then continue using that throughout the semester in different ways. And then third and final here, she says empathy, right? So uh, being able to, to recognize when your students need extra support. Um, so first of all, that's being approachable, showing them that you, you are open to them contacting you, you're open to them meeting with you, uh, but it also takes you checking in with them on an individual basis, right? Knowing who your students are and being able to check with them on an individual basis is really helpful. And then, of course, supporting students through, through difficult times. I think most of us have had an experience as an instructor where a student says, you know, I had, had a relative pass away or, you know, my, my child is sick or something like that, that they need a little bit of extra support to move through. They may need some sort of small accommodation, whether that's turning an assignment in later than, uh, than you had planned or whatever it is. But be, be responsive to your students and, and recognize when they need extra support. So an important part or important aspect of this for us as instructors is to reflect on our own teaching practice. Uh, and I love this quote. This is actually from the context of this is talking about the scholarship of teaching and learning. Uh, but Jay says, reflection entails a process of contemplation with an openness to being changed, a willingness to learn, and a sense of responsibility for doing, doing one's best. So I want to pause here for just a second, and I want you to reflect on your own teaching. So if you have a device, or if you want to flip to the notes in the back of your, your schedule, somewhere you can write something down, I want you to reflect on one thing that you can do to humanize your class. We've talked about a lot of things. Reflect right now on your own teaching, on your own class. What's one thing that you can do to humanize your own class? Okay, I'd love, to hear, I'd love to hear from you on some of the things you were discussing, either something you decided to share or something that was shared to you in your group. Who would like to, to share with the, the group here? And I'm going to hand you the mic, too. No pressure, though. Yeah. So here's a thought thing that it's not like something we're doing, but maybe something you can answer for us. But um, in a course that is asynchronous that students can take at their own pace, um, having trying to humanize it by having them discuss with each other when they can move through modules at different times, how can you facilitate that um, peer interaction um, when it's in that asynchronous manner? Yeah. That's a great question. So I have a few thoughts, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this back out to the group because I know we have experienced instructors here. Don, do you want to speak to that? Oh, you're telling me I have five minutes. Okay. I'll, I'll speak to that. Yeah. Don't let them do that. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, asynchronous. I teach, been teaching since 2013 online. Everything is asynchronous. You can do it. I don't care if you're doing it at 2 in the morning on Thursday, but there are deadlines for that, that module that week, and when you're, not, you're not moving on. I'm not going to release something. I'll release two weeks ahead so people are going on vacations, they got life, they're having a baby, I don't care what it is. But the discussions, I keep them together because we're moving through this content, and then I do a reflection every Monday morning where I call them out specifically in their reflection, and they know I'm going to read every single word. Um, so just to, the thing is, is keep them together. 
keep, keep them together. Even though it's asynchronous, put them in weekly modules where they're moving together. But I do release the content so those who have life, everyone, can get a little bit ahead, but they know, and they can get ahead on the discussions too, but I'm not gonna just say, yeah, you overachievers, go. And they're like at week 15 in three weeks, because that doesn't give them enough breath or feedback from me on the content that's being delivered. So don't let them do it. I love that. Um, I, I would echo that as well. Uh, for me, as an instructor, part of the experience of the course is providing those interactions with the students. That's an important part of the course. And so even if they do move ahead, whether it's two weeks or whatever, in their own progress, they still need to come back for those synchronous activities, whether it's an online discussion or whatever it is. Yeah. The synchronous meaning they have a week to do it. Like yeah, they could do it over a week, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, what else did you talk about in your groups? How, how else are you going to humanize your course? So I said, I'm gonna to go to the city and have Aaron uh, build out my course modules. <laughs> I, I, I told her if she showed her course, that was gonna happen. Now we all laugh, and I, I did say it like it was a little bit of a joke, but I'm serious. <laughs> Uh, also, isn't that a service that you guys provide? If we need help using design tools, and we're new, I mean, if we're new to that, and we want to get some scaffolding from you guys, that is a service you provide. That's real. Yeah. So I'm not joking. Yeah. I, I have Erin do my courses, too. Actually, it's true. She, she is fantastic at, at finding ways to to have visual indicators in your course that, that simplify and, and, and make the course look and feel, uh, have a better flow to it. It signals information to the students a lot better, yeah. All right, one more, one more item. How are you gonna humanize your own course? Charlie. So I'm gonna take this from a different perspective because I'm not currently teaching, but I'm a recent grad of the ITLS grad program and everything, so I just wanted to give my feedback as a very recent student that one of my favorite ways that I had a professor on online to humanize it was, and you just spoke about it, was to actually read and reply to our discussion posts. I had both within the program of I would do my discussion posts and then talk to my peers, get the grade because I did the work on it, but then I had other professors that would weekly jump on there and actually reply to ours and challenge us and kind of make us defend our opinions again. And I knew they were actually reading, and it made my effort in the discussion posts way more, felt more real. So thanks for, Aaron, you actually did that in that Captivate course when I took it. So you would make us actually defend our opinions, so. Yeah, please. <laughs> feedback on, um, I change my image every week mm. to reflect the content that we are studying. Okay. It's not that hard. It's really not that hard, but it's like, whoa, whoa, we're on this week, and it's also a visual cue, and I usually can, I take, do a little Photoshop work, and I put the topic embedded into it, and I try and pick beautiful pictures from various parts of the state, or, like, I'm a mountain biker, so there's pictures of, this is my recent trip to wherever, so it personalizes that, but each week, they, it reflects the topic, so that's one little, people, it's a very small thing, you're like, well, it's pretty interesting, we were like, what are we, we going to see this week? I like that. Thank you. An indication that you're in there, that you're in the course, and you're changing things, and, and you know, and so students are like, oh yeah, she's she's in there, she's paying attention. Yeah. Okay, we have one minute left. Any any final questions, thoughts that you'd like to share? Okay. Aaron, final thoughts. How many courses are you willing to edit? <laughs> this week? <laughs> Not very many. Um, but if you, yeah, if you need a simple, like a template set up or anything like that, you can let us know. We do offer that service. And like I said, it is one of my favorite things to do. So, and I can show you more examples if you want to see them. Yeah. When you're doing an online discussion, after they've posted, you allow them to see all the other posts. 
Is there any way that you use to ensure that they review the posts? That's, That's a good peer review that they usually just review one peer. So asking if you're having them look at all of the discussion posts from their peers. Yeah, I assume that they're not. I would assume that they're not reading all of them as well. And, and actually, I'm okay with that as long as they're engaging at, at a certain level. If they are looking at two or three and they're responding in thoughtful ways. To, to up the requirement for peer review to reviewing sure. three others? Yeah, absolutely. I, and I, could, I would be happy to, to share you some resources that I have on that as well. And don't yeah. I have to go in then and grade all three of their responses to all of their peers? It, if you're going to ask them to respond to three people, I would... I would be looking at all three of them, yeah. You I would, yeah. So if you have 40 students, you've got to go look at 120 posts to see that they uh, reviewed. Yeah, I would argue that if it's important to require them to do it, then it's important for me to look at what they're doing, yeah. But, but there's not a way that Canvas will automatically give them a point for each peer that they review, is there? I don't see no, there's not an automatic way to do that, no. You, you can't, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. If you use the speed grader, you can wait till they've gone through and commented, and you can look at an individual and see all of their posts in that one discussion forum, yeah. I, yes, I would, I would absolutely do rubrics that way. Yeah, and we, we have resources that we could share with you that, that speak to that. So thank you so much for coming to this session. Please feel free to reach out to, to Aaron and I. We're happy to continue this conversation.